As defined in an old Greek movie, the true meaning of kephi is that desire left over after pain and sorrow. It's that outburst that turns into a smile, a song, or a dance. Kephi is when you enjoy life in a holistic way and accept things you can't control but still find meaning in them. And sometimes, kephi is even stronger when life is tough, when you're grateful for the full spectrum of your emotions. Life is full of such contrasting moments, and that's what we talk about in the Kefi Podcast. Welcome to the Kefi Podcast with Daniel Landerman. Daniel is uh, has become a good friend of mine. You haven't always been a good friend of mine because I didn't know you. But since like I met you, <laughs> and now we're friends. <laughs> yeah, I met Daniel. like a year ago. <laughs> How is it going over there? It's going well. I can't complain. It's been you know working from home these days, yeah. so you know I always enjoy How, that. You enjoy that? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't prefer the office? I do not. I mean, I will say the office is easier for communication, yeah. but as far as my own productivity, uh, I just, I like working from home. I don't miss the one hour commute in each direction. Oh, okay. So yeah, I find myself a lot more well-rested. What do you, what do you use that commute for? You probably will say sketching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sketching also, uh, chipping away a bit more at some story development for my own stuff. I have a couple, um, novels that I'm wanting, I've been wanting to write for years and plural just, novels. Yeah. Two, two, but one is much further along. The other one was kind of a newer idea that I'm just world building on and all mm. that. So I'm not even close to getting in any kind of writing on that <laughs> okay and uh then why don't you write instead of sketching <laughs> <laughs> well so i'm doing i'm doing both doing a bit what i'm trying to do lately is start the habit of writing in the morning and then i get into work and then after work i'll do some sketching for myself and how does does the morning usually look for you like after waking up um it varies it kind of depends on how early i wake up mm -hmm. so i've been basically waking up at about 6 15 or 6 30 in the morning during the week and then you know get a shower get my latte going um and then jump into doing about an hour of writing and then get into work uh, usually around 9 nine thirty. it kind of depends though because i lead a team so sometimes i do have to deal with some more administrative stuff earlier in the morning to get everyone else going so so what is it what is it that you do for those who are not familiar with your work I work in advertising. I work at an ad agency in Hollywood and we do entertainment advertising. So ad campaigns for film and TV and video games, everywhere from key art, posters, covers, all of that to full trailers, digital. Uh, so kind of a full service studio. Uh, and then I lead the illustration team. Uh, within the agency. So we do a lot of sketching to help concept movie posters. We do sketching to help uh, kind of plan around photo shoots and stuff with yeah. actors and all that, as well as doing actual illustration if the project calls for it, which in the last couple of years, they've been wanting a lot of it. Yeah. For, for some reason, like the beginning of 2019, I don't know what happened. It was like someone flipped a switch and everyone wanted illustration. <laughs> It was crazy, which was, I mean, it was great, but we were al almost not prepared for it because before we'd get like one or two here and there, you know, everything was really just sketching. They wanted photo shoots for everything. And all of a sudden they're just like, wait, illustration's kind of cool. Since, since when is that? 
uh the beginning of 2019 so could this this have to be with the incredibly bad quality of movie posters before that <laughs> because they it's, were really I mean, fucking bad <laughs> it's possible you know um and people were I, laughing about it on social media remember like they yeah were i mean there, everywhere. there would be some ridiculously bad posters oftentimes we would see a finish come out uh thankfully from a, from other agencies not us um <laughs> but we'd, of course. we'd all be like oh my god like who approved that <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know so it it could have been it could have had something to do with uh with the quality of the posters it could i think it also had a bit to do with the fact that people are able to get a lot more painterly now in photoshop even mm. with photos right mm. and i think some of the stuff even the photo treatments were starting to have a certain illustrated look to them um that maybe helped the clients kind of not be so afraid of illustration mm -hmm. um but the so the one of the biggest changes was much of the illustration we were getting prior to 2019 was very flat and graphic type of stuff you know it's just that, that very kind of just flat tones and uh i think because they figured oh you look at that and it doesn't look like photos all of a sudden in 2019, what we were getting was people asking for very painterly stuff, which I had been pitching for years and it never went anywhere. <laughs> Have you ever thought about the, the one of the reasons also being the fact that, I mean, painted, painted uh, movie posters were a thing since the dawn of movies, but yeah. especially when you think about in, 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 the, in recent let's say history of movie posters it was very much a thing for uh the 80s and 90s and we are yeah. it was a thing up until photoshop was able to allow graphic designers to do a lot more with it uh and once that happened and they could actually use photos um then a lot of the agencies were putting pushing for that but yeah i don't know it was weird it was literally like at the beginning of the year after the new year we all came back into the studio and and all of a sudden it's like yeah but they want something really like kind of painterly and different i'm like huh okay cool i can do that and then got another ask at the same time saying the exact same thing you know and it just kept going and kept going so you know it's been great uh, i love that that they're wanting that kind of stuff so how long have you been freelancing before um, joining that studio? Because, I mean, you're illustrating a lot and just saying something like, OK, I'm going to going to join an advertising studio. Mm -hmm. That's probably not not something that every illustrator or, or artist right. would say, because, I mean, if you say advertising, the first thing that comes to mind is money. Cigarettes. Capitalism. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> money, <laughs> capitalism, selling out. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Working for the man. No, I'm just. Not. Yeah. I mean, I, I work in no, advertising totally, myself. Totally. But, yeah. Yeah. No, and and that's where I usually tend to have to specify that it's entertainment advertising. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not. It's not Mad Men. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Sadly, um, it's not Mad Men. All the whiskey. I, I, I mm. I'm not gonna lie. I had several <laughs> bottles of, of different kinds of whiskey sitting next to me at work, so it was a little Mad Men. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> but okay. So, Good. um, I started freelancing. Uh, let's see. At the end of 2003, it was actually I was going to Art Center in Pasadena at the time. It was the end of my first term there and uh, i just started doing little things little character designs and storyboards uh i got put into contact with with a guy uh greg aronowitz he's been in the industry for years and years uh mostly doing special effects sculpting anywhere from prosthetics to maquettes and all that stuff but then he started getting into making his own kind of indie films and stuff so i got put into contact with him and started doing stuff uh, like i said character designs and storyboards and was doing a lot of <clears throat> a lot of that 
through school and uh, just kind of on the side uh, did a little bit of comic book work uh, and then I did an internship at EA as well out in Florida doing uh, I was on their viz dev team so I was doing some concept design and then some in-game illustrations and stuff like that uh, and but through all that the kind of common thread was that I loved sketching you know, I love quick sketching. I love pencil on paper. At toward the end of of Art Center, I think it was like two months before I was graduating or something. My art director from EA got hired out to a game studio out here in Santa Monica, so he moved across the country. You know, from Florida out to Los Angeles, and he told me he's like, "Hey, when you graduate, you have a job." It's like cool. Awesome. <clears throat> and then uh, I think I think he may have it may have been like during the summer because I graduated in December. Um, but then it was about a month and a half before graduation that the studio that the game company shut that studio down. They had multiple studios, but that particular one, they shut it down. So I was like, awesome. Now I don't have a job when I graduate. <laughs> Shit. So, okay. Am I allowed to swear on here? Please. A lot. Okay. Okay, cool. Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, so, but I figured, you know, I'd been freelancing all through school. So I just figured, okay, I'll keep that going and uh, kind of see where that leads. And that's when a buddy of mine told me about sketch art in advertising. Now, his idea of advertising was Mad Men. Okay. <laughs> he was a smoker. He, the idea of like, uh, I think his dream was, you know, driving, driving up PCH in a Ferrari smoking cigarettes with a girl in the passenger seat doing Coke. Um, <laughs> and Coca-Cola. Like, Coca-Cola <laughs> is what it means. <laughs> uh, it's Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> And he was stuck in the 80s. So, you know, even though I don't even know if he was, well, he was technically born in the 80s, but he was younger than me. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, he, you know, he kind of, I had never heard of sketch art before. And he told me, he's like, oh, yeah, it's super fast turnaround. You're just sketching quick ideas on paper. You know, I was like, oh, dude, that sounds perfect. I, th- I should look at advertising. It's like, I don't know anyone in advertising. And then at my grad show, an ad agency that was local <clears throat> happened to have someone there and they saw my sketches and they're like, have you ever thought about being a sketch artist? Mm-hmm. It's funny. You should say that. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And then, and then I think like three weeks later they called me up and uh, they had had a couple sketch artists bail on them last minute. And so they're like, is a good time to, for you to come in and, and get established and, so I went in, um, you know, as a freelancer and, um, luckily I got to kind of sit next to a veteran sketch artist while, you know, cause it's my first time, uh, venturing into it. So I didn't know exactly what they were looking for, but so it was helpful to kind of sit next to him and pick his brain and kind of see what he was doing. Um, and then I think a few weeks later, they called me back for some revisions because the client actually, while they liked the concepts, the other guy sketched, I guess they liked my drawings more, you know, which kind of made sense because mine were probably a little more modern. His looked a little dated uh, and f- it was a video game company. So I think they wanted, it was for Darksiders. So I, they wanted a kind of edgy, edgier look. So the first Darksiders game <clears throat> um, I had done I had uh, drawn up all the concepts for that. Um, and then my buddy had, they, they then did a 3D render based on a sketch that they ended up picking. Um, and then a buddy of mine like painted it up to make it, you know, a little cooler and flashier. <clears throat> because you can't make um, it cooler and flashier. What? No. <laughs> well, you know, this was back, back in the day. He had a lot more experience than I did okay. uh, as far as painting things up. Uh, to a back in level. the day back in the day i mean this was 2008 so uh this was the beginning of 2008 
Uh, and so I was freelancing as a sketch artist after that, like that kind of became my bread and butter, um, for a while up until, let's see, I started working with bond, the agency that I'm currently at. I started as a freelancer there toward the end of 2013. Um, but <clears throat> think about three days in, they asked me if I would ever consider going full time. And <clears throat> I had considered it because, you know, I'd come through the recession that hit really the ad world. I'd say it hit us in like 2009, you know, and, and got pretty bad in 2009 and 2010. Um, I think there was a good eight months there where I was lucky if I could get three days of work a month. It was they were trying to do everything in house, trying not to use sketching. Uh, it was it was rough. Luckily at that point, I think my day rate. I want to say I was at maybe six fifty a day at that point. So you know, and I didn't have much overhead, so it was enough that even three days of work a month I was like, all right, at least I can like. <laughs> Pay my pay the rent. rent yeah and even even if sometimes it wouldn't happen to like the last day of the month <laughs> okay but wow <clears throat> yeah it was it was rough and um and then at a certain point that's why i started looking to see like hey does anyone want a full-time sketch artist you know because for me I, I was like man they could use sketching for so much you know that that otherwise they have to wait till they have assets that they can use to build ideas with. Um, but most people were not interested in a full-time sketch department. And then Bond asked me, so I was like, yeah, I would absolutely consider that. Uh, and then I think maybe four, five or six months later, then I ended up going full-time there. And so that was May of 2014. I've been there ever since. In, in the time that you were wor worried about getting enough to do, did this did this change your behavior towards accepting gigs after that, or generally the some sort of anxiety about this happening again? Yeah, um, <clears throat> you know what? Because during that time, I mean, I was I was applying for everything any kind of job listing that I thought I might be a fit for, you know, I was doing it, but there was also a stubborn streak um, <laughs> that I, that I probably learned some do's and don'ts from. Uh, that was mostly that I really wanted to work from home. And so I was kind of doing, I was doing most of that. And that was partly because you know, some of the ad studios were an hour and a half away. And they wanted me to come in and work. And it was only an hour and a half because of LA traffic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was like, let's see, probably 15 miles, maybe. But it would take an hour and a half. That's it? <clears throat> yeah. By foot? <laughs> right you would think you would think no because once you get across town one the freeways will be packed two you get to a point where you can't get there by freeway you have to take surface streets and sometimes it'll be a long way on surface streets i have experienced um, a, a, a traffic in, in los angeles in 2017 and i think before that my my, my beard was black <laughs> Mine used to be black. Yeah, and, and now <laughs> it certainly isn't anymore, at least not, not totally. And, and the thing like um, that I realized was, no, you don't give any signals if you're going left or right. Um, like like uh, passing the car, like, like, like uh, it, it's okay if you do this from the right side, obviously. Like there's yeah. no rule whatsoever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They don't, they don't even care. Yeah, and, and me, like, like the German uh, uh, Autobahn virgin, basically. Yeah, yeah, but everything is like super <laughs> sorted and then everything is fine. Yeah. I was just like freaking out. It was just yeah. too much. 
<laughs> you can imagine I was like, yeah, I, I would I would end up with like white hands inside, you know, like from it was like, ah. yeah. I mean, people have gotten. I will say they've gotten a little better about signaling when they merge. Really, um, in the past yeah. three years, I I yeah, I feel like they have gotten better. Um, or maybe it's just because I've always signaled, you know. But of course you have. Um, but you know, I f- I feel you on the German stuff. I drive an Audi. <laughs> What is the, the Audi drivers here in, in Audi drivers in, in uh, Germany and, and BMWs are the worst. I'm sorry. Oh, here's the anyone. BMW drivers. They are yeah. the, like notoriously assholes. So the, the Audi drivers Every time. are just. Audi like drivers that. tend to be really chill. Um, with the exception of like if you get some like young dude in like a, you know, S4 or something. Well, here it's like their own industry. And right. it's it, it's something that everybody knows. Like, probably probably someone who's driving an Audi now will be like, "Come on!" But no, that's for funny. Real, it's exactly yeah. Here like they that. tend. To, I I've noticed it's a lot of a uh, kind of older people that are driving them. Um, but the BMWs, no, all the all the young douchebags are like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, BMW. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and um g- going back to the topic um i i also wonder about about going to a studio you don't have uh, have, have you considered i mean it's probably something yeah i mean we, we could cut that still but i would prefer not sure. to uh, is, <laughs> is, is it something where you are like where, where you're missing freelancing at some point because i, mean, I, it, I do you know? um there are aspects of freelancing that i miss and i think that's one of the things that i love about the work from home order right now is it sort of has that freelance vibe without the stress of trying to hustle for work all the time <laughs> oh okay but the other side is then during the day, during the week, obviously my time is not my own, you know, but the nice thing is, is that at least between assignments um, or if I'm waiting for feedback, I can chip away on something of my own, you know, and it's in it, at least I have everything here and I can kind of bounce back and forth. Um, <clears throat> but but there are there are a lot of aspects of freelance that I miss. And I mean, it's interesting because when I went full time, I was very apprehensive because I did love freelancing. And by the time I went full time, the freelance gig was doing was going very well, mm-hmm. you know, um, like pulling in. You know, 10 to you don't, what? <laughs> 10 to 10 to 15,000 a month well yeah it's it's, you know is 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 it hard for you to talk about money no no i'm i'm the only reason i'm apprehensive is because um i don't i don't necessarily always like to get into specific current numbers but that's only from the standpoint of i don't think my employer would appreciate it yeah (laughs) But okay. otherwise, like I'm, I'm very open about like how much uh, artists get paid and should get paid because I think there should be some transparency there. Yes. Um, because you know part of the reason that we don't generally get paid as much as we should is because no one talks about it. Mm-hmm. You know so the amount that we get paid now is less than what we got paid 15 years ago. Now artists are getting paid less than they did like 10 or 15 years ago. I would say 15 years ago now. And 15 years ago, they were getting paid less than they did 10 or 15 years before that. Um, and, And I don't mean in terms of inflation, I mean, like the numbers, the flat out numbers are smaller than what they used to get paid. And a lot of that in the entertainment industry is due to, you know, the big studios um, and what they did basically in the late 90s, uh, essentially just all getting together saying, hey, let's stop trying to poach each other. 
you know, like the the employees, the artists and stuff from each other. And let's agree essentially to a salary cap because all we're doing is driving salaries up and we can put a cap we can put a cap on that if we agree to basically not compete for employees <clears throat> mind you it's super illegal for them to do that and it didn't come out till 15 years after the fact and by then it was it was too late to do anything about it um and so that basically drove salaries down and they have not changed. Never mind that entertainment properties make more money than they ever have before. You know, billion dollar properties, multiple, multiple billion dollar properties. And they'll whinge about having to, you know, start someone at 60 grand a year right out of school as opposed to 65 grand a year you know <clears throat> mm. and in some cases you're lucky if you're right out of school to get that a lot of places are trying to keep it around like 50 or 55 k a year and anyone that lives in los angeles knows how lame that is to have to try and live off that um, well that's i was just going there like that's a number in other countries where people would be probably selling their grandmother to someone. To yeah. Get that money. And hell, even here, if you were say, you know, somewhere in the Midwest, you wouldn't even have to go that far. Even inland in California, you could easily live off that, but then like you can't commute. You'd be commuting three hours <laughs> each way. And that you can't do that, you know? And <clears throat> so it's, you know, it, it's been, it's been a battle and, um, you know, there are times I, I get a little torn between two things, knowing that, hey, I'm a full time employee, but mm. I'm also hiring people. And there's a certain amount that I that I want to fight for them, you know, to mm. uh, to get what I think that that they're worth. Um, and also knowing how much like I had struggled at a certain point in that uh, during the recession. Um and I mean, it was not fun. I had student loans. I had the student loan creditors calling me fucking three, four times a day. What? You know? Yeah. Because I, I was like, I couldn't, I came out of school and my, my loan payments were like 1400 a month, mm -hmm. you know? And when I was lucky at a certain point to get three days of work a month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, sorry guys. Like, they were like, we'll have to take legal action. I'm like, what legal action? I don't own anything. <laughs> like, you're not going to get anything. Like, you're better off working with me. And so we can figure this out, you know, but it was stressful. It was like, um, you, not sleeping well. And every time the phone rang, you know, I'd, I'd like be afraid of who it was. And, you know, it, it sucked. <clears throat> And that's something that I don't want anyone else to ever have to go through. Has this um, has this also affected the way that you are um, dealing with business in general right now to never go to that point again? Yeah. What I've always done uh, with any negative experience is learn as much as I can from it, right? I've always taken the time to really reflect on it because then I... I don't consider it a negative experience. If I can turn it into a learning experience, then mm -hmm. I don't look back on it as necessarily a bad thing, you know, um, assuming I came out the other end. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and uh, I think if I had just sort of dwelled on it um, or dwelled in it, then it might've been more traumatizing. Although I, I will say, yeah, there are times that a bit of like that sense memory still like kicks in, you know, more, not so much in, in, on my part, but if I see someone else kind of struggling with some of that stuff and I kind of like instantly, I'm like, oh, 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 wait, no, no, it's all good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> you know, so there probably is, <laughs> there is a bit of trauma left over, but I did realize that okay my stubbornness of wanting to work from home what happened was the work had slowly started to taper off 
because advertising is so fast paced. And mm. if you don't take the time to put the FaceTime in, uh, the turnover rate at some agencies can be fast enough that if you wait six or eight months, sometimes the people that you were working with there might not be there anymore. They might be at another mm -hmm. agency and then hopefully they'll drop your name at this other agency, but the sketch art circle is pretty small. And so some, a lot of times agencies would al already have artists that they worked with all the time and they didn't want to try to cut their teeth on someone new. Um, yeah. So that's when I realized, okay, I, I have to start going back in at least to a degree. I need to go in, get to know some people, and then I can kind of pitch to them like, hey, look, I'm driving three hours a day because of traffic. How about I work from home? That way you guys can get a couple more hours of work out of me instead of mm -hmm. you guys paying me to literally sit in the car and do nothing. And a lot of people were, yeah. were game for that, you know, but it was, it was really important that I kind of started to go back in and I mean, instantly work started picking up again once I started doing that. Um, and that's kind of when it got busy again. And then of course I was offered the full-time gig. <laughs> and I was, I was like, okay, but I, th I thought I was going to do it for like two years and then, um, and then bail. And, you know, now it's been six years, six and a half years. Sounds good. <laughs> but they've been, they've been really good to me. You know, they like, they were there at a time that, um, you know, part of it was that right about the time that they give, gave me the the uh, official full-time offer um <clears throat> my dad had passed away and mm -hmm. so it was there was a part of me that that went very internal for a while and so i really just didn't want to hustle for freelance work anymore i was like i don't i don't have the mm -hmm. added energy for this right now and mm -hmm. and i was like and i love working with these guys because they bring me in on the concept process Every other agency, I was just a wrist for them. You know, they would feed me concepts and I had to draw exactly what they wanted. Um, sometimes they would say, hey, if you have any ideas, you know, but from day one, Bond, when, I, when we looked at my first round of sketches for them, they flat out asked me, hey, wh what do you think? Is there anything you think we could do to make these concepts better? And I was like, why? Well, yes, I have ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, there, there were a lot of a lot of good things about them um, and the timing of it. You know, it worked out. And I don't think there's another agency that I would work full time for. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if I wanted to kind of switch things up, I would I would go back to freelance. But I, I can't think of another agency that I would accept a full-time offer from that's high praise yeah i mean they're you know they're good people i remember when when i had a situation with with my with my former employer that they were basically doing also something that i'm still grateful to the day even though there was a lot of stuff there i wasn't grateful for in, in the end but i wonder because because i was staying there for longer because i felt um like i owed them something uh, they, they were um, giving me this backup and the security in a time where i really could need it would you say that applies to you i think i think there's a bit of loyalty <laughs> you know there but it's also that now I mean, six and a half years in, uh, I've done, you know, I've done some freelance projects here and there, uh, over, over those years. Um, so you're allowed to work freelance at the same time. Yeah, but not for another agency. So, mm -hmm. you know, cause that would be a conflict of interest. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, I did stuff for, uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I've done stuff for Privateer Press, you know, little, little jobs here and there. I've done some stuff for like upper deck and not, I don't think I've taken on like major jobs. 
mostly because I'm like, no, I'm still working full time. I don't have the time to dump into like crazy mm. big projects on the side. Um, but it's more that one thing it allowed me to do was take jobs that were fun, not just because like they paid better or something mm. like that, you know, mm. even though, and this is something I will always say to every freelancer, um, always negotiate, you know, whatever the first rate they throw out, up it. Mm. <laughs> and I do that. And, and it doesn't matter, like, because there are some projects, Upper Deck has zero budget, you know, but when they ask me to do the cover for one of their Firefly games, I'm like, fuck yeah, <laughs> Firefly, hell yeah, mm. Mm. <laughs> you know. Um, and yeah, they don't have a budget, but I'm still gonna, whatever, I don't even remember what they paid. I don't think it was much considering it was a full illustration and all that stuff. I, um, I think maybe it was like on the low end of, of a book cover or something. I want to say it was somewhere around a thousand dollars. It might've even only been like $800, but, but that was more doing it out of a love for Firefly, you know, but I want to say that they first said, you know, we've got a $500 budget. And I was like, no, I can't, you know, I want to do this, but this is what I normally get paid per day. And at the time I want to say it was around uh, 850 a day. Um, is what I was making. And so I was like, I can't, I can't do it for 500. And I know you guys can't meet my day rate because this is multiple days of work, but you're going to need to do better than that. <laughs> you know, um, you, you seem to have a super healthy attitude towards dealing with, with struggle. And I, I'm sitting here and I'm listening and I keep wondering. Is this something that you would rather say you achieved yourself? Is it something that came from from your family and your upbringing, or did do you have experience with therapy? Like, where is this coming from? This is much of it would be family and upbringing. Um, my uh, my mom is very spiritual. You know, she's born and raised in India, raised Hindu. Um, so, and and she always really embraced all of that. Um, I mean, she still does. She's an Ayurvedic practitioner and does Vedic astrology and <laughs> all this stuff. Um, I grew up with meditation, right? Like from day one, as far back as I can remember, okay. we would sit through uh, meditations with her. Um, and then even preschool through third grade, I think. Um, you still do that? I went, Are you still meditating? Hmm? Are you still meditating to the day? You know, now drawing is a meditation for me. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's very calming. And I go to the same place because what I've found with drawing and I, and I kind of discovered this, I think I was at the end of, of junior high. Uh, so like eighth grade, um, what would happen is I would draw at night, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'd be really tired, but I'd want to get one more drawing done. Mm -hmm. And so I'd get one done. And then the next day I'd look at it and it would be like the best drawing I had done, you know? And I was, and I was like, all right, tonight I'm going to make a better one. <laughs> you know. And so then I'd, I'd come back after school, do my homework and all that stuff. And then sit down and be like, okay, I'm going to do a better drawing. And then it wouldn't be as good and I'd be all frustrated. I'd keep drawing, keep drawing. And I'd get really tired and I'd be like, okay, I do one more drawing. And I'd look at it the next day and that one was the best one. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, what's going on here? Why am I always doing my best drawings when I'm really fucking tired? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. And I think because I had grown up medit meditating and all that, I understood like clearing my mind. You know, I... Because I had always done that. And what I realized was that I was kind of, I was getting out of my own way. I wasn't overthinking it when I was really tired. Because I didn't have the brain capacity when I was really tired to <laughs> overthink it. Mm -hmm. And 
so I just kind of, because I would do stuff sometimes and I'd be like, how did I know how to do that? How did I understand what that looked like? You know, I just, I didn't think about it. I just drew it, but how did I know how to draw it? You know? And yeah, it was intuition. It was basically letting my subconscious do the heavy lifting instead of that conscious mind trying to, you know, tally up all those figures and, and weigh all the, you know, pros and cons of this mark and that mark and this line weight and how dark and how light and blah, blah, blah. And <clears throat> so I think once I kind of realized that, then that became a common practice for me when I was drawing to clear my mind, turn my conscious brain off to a degree you know, obviously when, when you're working on a work assignment, you have to hit certain marks, right? You need certain compositions. It has to be accurate if you're, if you're basing it on an actor or a game model or whatever. Like, so the conscious mind has to pick out those details and say, okay, this needs to go here, 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 here. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of that is in the rough sketch for me. And then when I do the finish that's when i kind of just let my subconscious take over and and just kind of go off of intuition and just what feels right for the image and so that really becomes uh the meditation for me mm -hmm. um, so even when i'm after a long day at work oftentimes like i would come home and draw in order to unwind <laughs> from drawing all day <laughs> yeah, but it's a different kind of drawing it's not like someone it is, asks, it is. asks when, you to do when it's out of your own head there's almost uh -huh. like no right or wrong except mm -hmm. obviously getting the anatomy right if you're drawing figures and, and mm -hmm. that kind of stuff if if that's the point of the drawing it might not be maybe you're into abstract expressionism or something mm -hmm. <laughs> you know which i'm not but some people are <laughs> yeah i don't judge <laughs> 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 but I mean, this is this is this is a pretty interesting thing to me because I have I've tried meditation, and uh, it was yeah. I mean, frankly said, it just wasn't for me because I also felt like um, that um, something like that comes close to meditation for me were, are just other things that I do in life. But what what was asked of me was basically to just sit and uh, try to find my center uh, turn my thoughts inwards and all these things mm -hmm. but i do that anyway like this yeah. is this is just something that that i i'm doing when i'm sitting down and staring at the wall right? yeah, yeah yeah so the the whole aspect of because the guy was telling us to get uh, something to sit on it has to be something like this because we're doing in the way that I learned it in the monastery in Thailand, right. and uh, and he was he was cool about it because he was very very practical about it, and it was not like this, we are not nothing doing nothing spiritual here. We're not doing uh, the whole uh, chakra stuff and whatever. He yeah. was just like we're just turning the antennas from outside to inside, sure, uh, which sure. was cool. But then yeah. he demanded all these things, and they hurt my feet because I'm from the <laughs> west. Yeah, yeah, no, I I <laughs> you know? I know when I when I was really into. Uh, martial arts in my kind of in my teenage years uh, yeah. and early 20s uh, one of the dojos that I had trained at for a while you know everything was hardwood floor and yeah you'd have to sit you know with your feet all flexed yeah. back and yes. on you know on your knees and and yeah. it's like and like I've got these like bony ankles and bony feet and it just Hurt, you know so yeah. after a while i'd be kind of fidgeting and like daniel stop moving mm. <laughs> you know be like i can't help it it hurts like this is stupid yeah i know exactly what uh, you mean I had, we had the same experience in kendo but in in the end yeah. in the end uh for meditation the idea i mean i can i can force myself to endure the pain sure. through the whole thing sure but meditation is you can't just try to meditate and right, be like, right. And it's a very that's like to me that is for a very different purpose if all yeah. you're trying to do is like <clears throat> clear your head and and maybe like calm down a bit and de-stress yeah. then no, no putting pain into the equation doesn't do it no and the, the guy was telling us like you get used to it and i'm like when <laughs> yeah 
what after years of <laughs> yeah you know building up calluses and, and, and then then after i paid you deposits. how much how much for this course i paid you and then i can at yeah. some point years later can start meditating yeah. or what you know you know it's interesting what it did a lot for me because i was already meditating a lot but i didn't necessarily have a method that i really liked you know until <clears throat> i read the wheel of time oh really yeah his his method of the flame and the void just worked for me because it was something i already kind of did but there was a visual property to it which for me as an artist so what he explained uh the way he had described it was essentially you you picture like yourself you know sitting in nothingness and you picture a flame right and you're sitting inside that flame and then any thoughts that come in you feed into that flame till they burn up till it's just you and the flame in this empty space you know and and it was basically all about controlling conscious thoughts so that yes yeah, sometimes there are thoughts like skittering around outside somewhere but you basically like don't let them in so that your mind is just you know blank and and the idea was cuz i was also <clears throat> really into like reading the stuff that bruce lee wrote and and all that stuff and how he would talk about you have to be one with your opponent, you know, so that when they move, you move and it's instinct, it's not thought, you know. And so it's kind of a lot of similar concepts that sort of fit together. Um, <clears throat> but it was with that, that sort of methodology that after reading mostly the first book of the Wheel of Time, I was like, oh, my God, that makes so much sense. And I would literally I would sit there and practice it and practice it and practice until I could just sort of at will just like clear my mind you know and and it's helped a lot um even just in communication uh in the workplace um we used to have a creative director there that um you know some people had a hard time working with because they wouldn't understand what he was asking you know they'd have conversation after conversation after conversation and he and I could exchange just like a few sentences and I just understood what he was asking for, you know? And there was a certain amount of just like where you kind <clears> of, <throat> I guess like it's kind of empathy, but it, but it's, it's almost more of a, just a subconscious thing in communication between two people where you don't have to say a lot and you're able to kind of fill in the rest of that and and i don't know if other people were just looking too hard at every single specific word that he was saying or what but uh <clears throat> you know be multiple people sketching on a presentation and he would just never have any revisions for my sketches and then other people would have to revise and revise and revise and revise you know and so there is something in there that has helped me with communication because i've had that with pretty much anyone that I've worked for um, <clears throat> where we just haven't had to get into crazy discussions to try and understand, a, you know, it's like, it's one sketch. We shouldn't be talking for two hours about this idea. I would have been done with the drawing already. <laughs> yeah. So. You didn't mention therapy. And so for people in America, I think, therapy is something or well, let's say for people in california or specifically in la uh i think that that uh therapy or going to therapy seems something way more natural than it is in in europe uh here it's basically we're, we're catching up with uh with with sanity let's put it like that is it in so i'm curious in europe is it is it because are are you saying that more people there could use some therapy or that they kind of don't need it as much in Europe. Uh, I think the 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 stigma of uh, therapy in general is more towards being a loon mm -hmm. and not about being in pain, just not right. in the body. Right. 
And right. I think that a lot of aspects of uh, people getting help to just have someone to talk to because they might not have anyone who's listening the right way. Yeah. Yeah, this yeah. is just something that is th that is very different here than I have uh, he heard it from people that I know from from your country, and yeah. uh, also other. I mean, some countries in in, in uh, Europe are okay with this. And like I can pr possibly only speak of uh, what I know about this from from Germany, <clears throat> Greece, sure. uh, Italy, and uh, let's say uh, also France and. Uh, I think the Netherlands are a little bit better with these things, but I feel like they are more progressive about a lot of things anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so I think Europe has quite a lot um, to catch up to. And uh, so I wonder you as someone, I mean, you you live in LA, not yet, like mm -hmm. you were born and raised in LA too? No, I was born in Northern California okay. um, in Sonoma County, which is about uh sebastopol to be specific which is about an hour and a half north of san francisco mm -hmm. um <clears throat> basically where a lot of the really nasty wildfires have been happening yeah um yeah. you know a lot of uh childhood memories got burned up between this year and last year Ouch. um but um yeah i mean you know wine country farmland kind of I wonder. I wonder if if one of the reasons for this um, is also, you know, the 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 since you brought up San Francisco, it just crossed my yeah. mind. Uh, <laughs> herbs, and <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, but generally, like like the the the, the, the whole hippie uh, mm -hmm. thing, the movement for for yeah. uh, which I mean, it's funny because up there now, man, it's so not hippie. It's all yuppie <laughs> and. and silicon valley like yeah but all these people like, who went through this are basically basically yeah. like the therapist from today or maybe the generation right, after right, right? so now, I wonder... you know we had done briefly we had done a bit of family therapy mm -hmm. um <clears throat> it was pretty brief and on honestly i i think it was more of my parents were doing marriage counseling and then sometimes my brother and i would be part of the session okay but um i never really got much from it because to me i was like well we're just like talking about <laughs> our feelings and what we're going through which my family mm -hmm. and i we did that anyway like my mom was very into communication mm -hmm. you know <clears throat> so so we were just used to kind of talking about that stuff um I, and I think at the time, I also didn't quite understand where therapy fit in. Like, I okay. get it. I get why people would do that, especially if you're talking about, like, any kind of relationship counseling. Sometimes you need that mediator, you yeah. know, that yeah. in-between person that, that isn't judging anybody. And, you know, because friends aren't always good for that. They tend to take someone's side, <laughs> you know. Um, I don't like, I've never really felt the need, I think, for therapy. I think I've always had a pretty good handle on like, okay, this is how the best way for me to deal with this. I think sometimes people don't know how to deal with something and they need an outside kind of opinion. But on the flip side, uh, my mom has always also been a counselor as well. So I think in a way growing up, <clears throat> while I can say, oh, hey, I, I never really needed therapy. She is also a counselor, so I could just talk to her. And <laughs> So that's why. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I'm, you know, it's cheating. But is it the same still? Like, um, have there been situations where you thought maybe there's someone who should, like I mentioned, like should should listen, know how to listen? You know, now, now I feel like my life maybe isn't dramatic enough to need therapy. <laughs> 
That's a way to put it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, like I mean, who knows? That can always that can always change. But um, I I tend to make a concerted effort to keep things pretty drama free. Mm-hmm. I guess. Um, and and I've also, you know, with I think all this added white in my beard has maybe added a little bit of wisdom (laughs) (laughs) where (laughs) where I also understand sometimes when uh, something can be just a phase, you know, and Mm -hmm. because there were times where I was like, oh my God, I don't want to work full time anymore. Whatever it is, you know, whatever it was like, I I can't, I can barely stand this and blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, there were times that I was like an inch away from, from just throwing in the towel and, and then just saying, I'm going back to freelance, you know, but it was usually because there was some kind of like drama at work that was out of my control, Mm -hmm. you know, where I was butting heads with someone and in a way that was making the work experience, you know, not pleasant. <clears throat> um, but rather than kind of giving into that, I sort of had to sit back and say, okay, well, all right, what is causing this feeling? What is it that that I'm not enjoying? Is it that things are stressful? Is it that this person's making me angry, so I'm going into work angry every day? Like, what what is it, you know? <clears throat> and depending on what it is, is there someone at work that I can discuss this with to help rectify this situation? Sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes it was just like, all right, I got to maybe approach the situation in a different way. Sometimes it's not giving that person as much power over your <laughs> well-being. Uh-huh. it you know like realizing that okay hey my position there is illustration director like i have a certain amount of clout and power to say yes or no to things you know i have the right to put my foot down on certain aspects of projects and i think some of it was growing pains kind of the company was growing the uh, my position my responsibilities were growing And it was all, we were all trying to figure it out. So there was stress all around. And I think once I really saw that, I was like, okay, no, this person's not an asshole. They're just trying to figure this out just like I am. They're just not dealing with their stress as well. (laughs) You know, (laughs) so they're lashing out. They're Mm. lashing out at people, Um, which I, you know, I learned a while ago, mostly through experience of being the one lashed out on mostly in past uh, relationships, Mm. (laughs) you know, where, you know, the girl I was with would would get stressed out and I would get the butt end of that. You know, they'd get angry with me when the stress had nothing to do with me. And I was always like, what the fuck is going on? Like, chill out. I'm trying to help you. (laughs) Like, I'm here for you. Like, why are you getting pissed at me? And so I think after dealing with that multiple times, I learned like, okay, lashing out is not the way to solve problems, you know, but some people don't, uh, haven't learned that yet. And some people never learn that, (laughs) you know? And so then when you see that happening, you have to kind of sometimes take it in stride. Sometimes it might be a conversation with them saying, Hey, look, um, I get what you're saying, you know, or like, I, I see what the problem is and I, I understand. Um, but how about instead of putting people down, like instead of putting me and my team down (laughs) saying the sketches aren't getting it done or whatever, you know, Mm -hmm. let's look at what the actual problem is and, and let's figure out the solution. You know? So you are the mediator. Sometimes. Sometimes. Sounds like you are (laughs) made for this, like literally. (laughs) Well, uh, I mean, for whatever reason, what's funny is like, 
given my given my druthers, I would not have necessarily chosen to lead a team. <clears throat> Except that I have found that that I'm pretty good at it because I can communicate with people and people enjoy communicating with me. You know, and and this is where I'm always like, man, if only people could do this in politics, you know. <laughs> the people that want to be in politics are the people that should not be in politics. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like I didn't necessarily want to lead a team, but I'm pretty good at it. So maybe I should so you're, <laughs> lead you're, a team. You're so John, I do currently. You're John Snow. <clears throat> oh, I, I guess, but not quite as pouty. <laughs> because there's this this this, <laughs> this character always in these movies, right? It was like, yeah, I don't want to lead. The reluctant, the reluctant hero. But you're hero. the best. You're already <laughs> leading. No, I don't want to lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all he did was pout and bitch and moan about it. <laughs> yeah, but he looked really pretty doing it, so we put up with it. <laughs> so how 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 are you holding against that? No, I'm kidding. come on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I I had to. You make it too easy, dude. I I enjoyed this so much. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, there Absolutely. was. I'm sure there was a lot of uh, of things that people can can take from this, and uh, I hope. We I can hope so. Repeat this. I yeah, hope so. really, really. So uh, thanks, and uh, until next time. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, man. Always good to see you. Bye bye.